clear, 38 degrees at O'Hare. Your next news update is at 8. Chicago's Morning Answer with Dan and Amy continues next on AM560, The Answer. This hourly segment is brought to you by Retire Chicago. Tune in Saturday mornings at 8 to Retire Chicago with John McNamara of McNamara Capital. When you've got questions, he always has an answer. It's Sean Hannity. This afternoon at 2 on AM560, The Answer. Top of the morning, Dan and Amy. Interesting uh, piece in Politico. Uh, I mentioned the other day we didn't have time to delve into it, but we do now. What teaching ethics in Appalachia taught me about bridging America's partisan divide, uh, Appalachia brought, uh, sort of reintroduced to the political map last cycle. Well, I, should, I mean, in 2016, I meant. With uh, J.D. Vance's Hillbilly Elegy, surprise bestseller. And just the, uh, the stories about the plight of middle-aged, poor white people in places in this country like Appalachia who are actually seeing their life expectancy decline, even as we are um, the richest country the world has ever seen. Uh, and uh, uh, sort of the forgotten man, to borrow on Amity Schley's uh, reference, too. Uh, so it's interesting that uh, Professor Evan Mandry uh, taught ethics in that community and has written about some of the lessons that he took away from his experience as an instructor there that may be instructive to our politics. We're pleased to be joined by John Jay College of Criminal Justice professor Evan Mandry. He's the author of A Wild Justice, The Death and Resurrection of Capital Punishment in America. Uh, professor, thanks for joining us. Appreciate it. Uh, Evan is good. Uh, thanks for having me. Good morning. Uh, thank you, uh, Evan. So um, uh, let's just start at the beginning because I like um, <laughs> I like the question that you ask uh, your students prior to getting into the sum and substance of the syllabus. What, what's that question you start class with? Uh, I I, uh, I select somebody randomly, and um, if um, they uh, I say that I'm a tough grader and the class average will be a B minus, but Everybody will get an A. They just have to point to someone to get an F. <laughs> so they have to designate someone to get an F. Yeah, uh, so okay. right, right. So then the class a, the class average goes up to a three nine, but one oh, person there you gets go. an undeserved F. And and how do the students react to this? Uh, a lot of people volunteer uh, to never, single out somebody <laughs> for the F. I've never, I've never had somebody, uh, never had somebody do it. You've never had me as a student. Uh, I could pick out the F right, right out of the right, game. Like I Sally in the back row, out, yeah. the girl in the green, she's the one. Well, so and and so you do that uh, to to impress upon the students what exactly? Um, I mean, I think we start well, first of all. It's just sort of an intro, uh, an introduction to ethics, and mm -hmm. I think we all have sort of an intuitive sense that of fairness and that. Other people's interests matter. We don't just go, unless you're a sociopath, you don't just go through the life selfishly. And, um, you know, it introduces some of the topics that we discuss in the course. We talk about utilitarianism as a framework. So it is from a utilitarian standpoint in terms of like, you know, maximizing the overall class average, it would be justifiable, but nobody really thinks it's fair. It's just really a discussion starter. Yeah, um, but I like the idea of discussing what's fair and the, uh, and the underlying qualities that determine something to be fair or unfair because fairness is so much uh, the watchword in our politics. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, I mean, I think what's interesting is um, there's lots of social psychology research that backs this up is that, um, you know, Republicans and Democrats agree on a lot more than they disagree about. Most people have a pretty shared sense of fairness. Um, you know, when you ask people opinions in a politically situated conflict you can um conversations can get derailed but uh, most people have got senses of what's right and wrong that's shared so uh the john jay college of criminal justice that's in uh new york city that's a big city uh you were teaching right. at appalachian state that's not in a big city mm -hmm. um how would you uh, compare and contrast the students that you encountered at the two schools um so I have three reference points. Uh, I, I was a, I, I was a, an undergraduate and a, a law, law student at Harvard, and I, I did a bunch of teaching when I was there. So that kind of is one extreme. Uh, 
I've taught at John Jay, which is um, about 75% of our students come from families making less than $30,000 a year, and it's extremely diverse. And then Appalachian State was remote. I mean, I, I heard your lead-in. I mean, I do think the students I taught weren't a representative sample of Appalachia. Um, yeah. First of all, they're college students, yeah, so they're right. self-selected in some way, right? They're right. open to a certain type of experience. And, um, you know, the, the very, very smart conservative kid who I um, spend a lot of time talking to in the article, uh, talking about in the article, you know, he's exceptionally open-minded. I mean, he has his viewpoints, but, uh, you know, I, I, I can't say that that's, uh, I, I don't have enough data to say that that's everybody, but um, the students, you asked me how the students compared, they were great. And basically, I've, I've met very few students in my life that I didn't think were great. I mean, people, are, if they're in college, they want to learn and they want to discuss ideas. And so, you know, you can always have a good conversation. Well, I mean, uh, students at college, they want to learn and they want to discuss ideas. Maybe uh, some of the coverage of what's happening at college campus is stilted, but there's a lot of academics who would uh, disagree with that statement in terms of the environments that uh, their college campuses have become. So, I mean, I'm, I'm not disputing that that's your experience and that uh, you that's that, and that's great to hear. But there's a lot of suggestion that that is not uh, uh, evenly distributed throughout uh, academia. Yeah, I mean, I, I think the stories, you know, I, I follow all the stories. Uh, I, I know what happened to Allison Stranger at, uh, at Middlebury, and yeah. I've read about, you know, Charles Murray. And I, and I think those conflicts, um, you know, and I say this as someone who's a lefty, I mean, I, I think uh, liberal students are getting that wrong. Anytime somebody's acting to suppress speech, that's wrong. Um, but I don't think it's representative. I mean, I think the way that... Uh, <clears throat> politics are represented in uh, cable news. I think they take the most uh, extreme situations, and I think that is kind of makes for interesting dialogue. So I do think those, as someone who teaches ethics, I think it's interesting to discuss extreme cases. So I think it's it's good that they're discussed. And I think that's different than saying that's kind of like the median experience of a student or an academic. I, I've never seen anything like that in my career. Um, I've seen students protest. I've seen um, dialogues, but I haven't seen, you know, somebody's arm broken or, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, somebody shouted down where, to the point where they couldn't speak. Um, although it is interesting to note, I mean, it's just in terms of uh, sort of campus culture, because I think Andrew, Sull uh, Andrew Sullivan wrote this piece uh, six, seven months ago. We're all on one big college campus now, and it wasn't complimentary about our culture. So that was, uh, that was, uh, uh, from its premise, an indictment of campus culture. And you have the rise of um, enterprises like uh, Jonathan Haidt's heterodox. That says something about what a lot, a lot of academics, including academics who uh, consider themselves left of center, believe about academia these days, doesn't it? Um, I agree with, I don't know if I agree with the premise. I, I, I'm a big fan of, of Haidt's work, and I reference it in my piece, and mm -hmm. I think the coddling of the American mind. I, I agree with the premise of the coddling of the American mind. And I would say it actually is the explicit takeaway from my piece. So uh, I say, you know, we teach people not to talk about religion and politics and it's wrong. We should teach people how to talk about religion and politics and we shouldn't construct safe spaces. We should, should construct spaces in which constructive conflict can occur. So um, I'm totally with his message, but I don't think he would say um, that, He's making an empirical assertion. I don't think he's saying that that is the normal experience. Um, you know, Middlebury and uh, Berkeley are, are, are not, you know, they're not representative of college campuses in, in lots of different ways. They're much yeah. more affluent there. Uh, and, um, you know, I also think Haidt talks a lot about parenting styles and, and how that leads uh, certain types of kids to be very oversensitive to dialogue that they perceive to be hostile. But I also think that that's not the median experience of a kid. It's the experience of a, an upper middle class or upper class kid who has helicopter parents. And, and again, I think they're worthy of discussion. I, I just don't draw from that that that's the average experience of a college student. Well, do your kids come to your to your class with you know political leanings on their T-shirts, or do you know where they stand politically? Do you discuss that? Um, sure, I, I try to be pretty open about it. I mean, my favorite, I 
prefer to teach students who disagree with me. I mean, I, I'm doing this a long time. I, I basically have spent my life like talking about controversial issues. I'm a, I'm a death penalty scholar. Um, I, I like these conversations and, you know, talking to like-minded people is just boring. Um, so, <laughs> you know, I make it clear that it's a safe space in the sense that all I really care about is the quality of reasons that people offer for their positions and, and trying to help them make the best uh, arguments that they can to support their positions. And uh, I actually, you know, I, I would say I, I went to Appalachian State seeking uh, difference, not similarity. Uh, maybe it's an expectation uh, issue as well. One of the points that you make in your piece, and you reference uh, Ravi Ayer, who's a social psychologist, is that uh, people people don't just change their, change their, their mind, change their opinions. They change their, uh, in terms of their belief system, they just change their opinion about the person with whom they disagree. And maybe that's all we really need to focus on achieving rather than persuading somebody who, uh, uh, you know, is, believes in the socialism as an economic system versus somebody who believes in capitalism. You're not going to change my opinion, but you could I could change my opinion about the socialist. A hundred percent. And it's just a better starting place. Um, there's a I, I met a lot of people who, who teach kind of different style. Uh, methods of dialoguing across difference. And one, a woman named Rhonda Fitzgerald, who I really admire, said that opinions aren't really very helpful. And, you know, at the simplest place, and, uh, you know, I, 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 you guys, for your show, probably leans more right than, than, yes. than uh, mine. And so, you know, if I start and say, hey, you, you put me on and you say, hey, what do you think about Trump? Well, I, I presume we'll just sort of fight, you know, we'll get defensive. <laughs> and, if instead I ask you, hey, how many kids do you have? Where do you go to? Where do they go? What do they do? You know, what do you like to do? Turns out you like to hike or you like dogs, and we find some commonality. You know, I think if we start from our shared humanity, um, you know, it's a better starting point than seeking out conflict. And, and cable news, unfortunately, I think kind of the standard presentation of issues is conflictual, um, and social media really lends itself to that. To that type of dialogue, uh, longer conversations are better. Face-to-face conversations are better, and you know, starting from trying to understand who the person is before we focus on some very narrow position that they have. Because I'm sure, even if we started yelling at each other about opinions, the truth is, you know, we'd actually even have shared ground within those opinions if we just operated from a position of mutual trust. All right. With all that being said, what do you think about Trump? No, I'm just yeah, kidding. Okay. I'm kidding. Um, <laughs> <laughs> no, so, I, like, so this is an optimistic piece. Uh, you uh, are very complimentary of the students uh, you taught at Appalachian State. Uh, you say it gives you, gave you a richer understanding of Southern conservatives and libertarians uh, and even greater optimism. And I want to be optimistic, too, but um, uh, reality makes it very difficult. I guess I, there's a little bit of... Uh, neo-existentialism combined with my Catholicism in there somewhere. I don't know how to unpack it, but um, I, I, I like this idea if you actually, and you obviously believe it would work. I'm just not sure that it would work. You, uh, you close your piece saying, um, instead of requiring a swim test for college students or a gym for middle schoolers, what if we required students to sit in a room with a diverse group of people and listen to stories of their life? Uh, and that was sort of that the, the, the part of the entrance exam was, can you do that in a civil and thoughtful way? Uh, and I guess that would be a way to qualify people in or qualify people out that, that may, may but your experiences, you think that most college students, most young people could and would do that. Uh, I mean, if, you know, you said, would it work? I mean, it depends how you define work. Would it end all conflict in the world? Of course not. No. Um, would it dramatically reduce polarization? Oh, 100%. There's overwhelming data from social psychology on on this. I mean, the more experience, you know, why are college students on the whole more tolerant um, than people having from graduating from college? It, it's not that they're smarter. It's that they subjected themselves to an experience where they have to accommodate different. And so the more we take ourselves out of, um, you know, echo chambers where we're just interacting with like-minded people and we're, we're forced to interact with people who differ from us, either in the way they're built or um, their ideology, well, it's just going to change our outlook 
dramatically. He is Evan Mandry, professor at John Jay College of Criminal Justice, author of A Wild Justice, The Death and Resurrection of Capital Punishment in America. Check out his piece in Politico, which I'll retweet uh, at Dan Proft. What teaching ethics in Appalachia, in Appalachia taught me about bridging America's partisan divide. Professor Evan Mandry, thanks so much for joining us. Appreciate it. Hey, thanks. Thanks. Have a great day. Take care. Yes, and he joined us on our turnkey.pro answer line. Before you see it on TV, share it on Facebook or read about it in the paper. Hear it here first. This is Chicago's Morning Answer on AM 560. The Answer. Balance of Nature. Changing the world one life at a time. And balance of nature from my energy and everything, it does make it much easier for me. I I love it. I really, <laughs> I tell everybody about it. And uh, I love when they have the shows when they when the doctor speaks and all. So it really it it lifts your spirits too, knowing that there's somebody out there that really wants to help you.